so to put things into context about my background, I'm a lawyer by profession and ended up in geothermal by pure accident uh, through uh, investment banking. And that has been a very interesting journey uh, to where I am today, simply due to the fact is that I've always had to, in one way or another, explain geothermal uh, and connect both the financing work uh, that we've been doing and the general public with the uh, opportunities that geothermal uh, offers. So it's always been a little bit of that kind of intermediary between the technology without having, let's say, the full background and, and knowledge in that uh, to, to explain geothermal and, and promote and sell geothermal. So when I've asked to give this presentation, I, I, I saw this ambitious uh, agenda put up and I tried to work with it. And, and it might be a little bit different than you expected, but I hope you stick with me and uh, understand this as, as a, as a as a basis for, for discussions to, to be had. So that's why I called this uh, presentation an attempt to positioning a low enthalpy uh, geothermal. So I want to start kind of very briefly, I guess, and in, in many ways also to put things into perspective. Uh, and this is the energy transition that we're going through on, on, on so many levels and, and in the discussions. And we're seeing this complete move away from fossil fuel based uh, to zero carbon uh, and with this big ambition to reach this by the second half of the century. So we will have to see if that's feasible or not. And clearly we need all kinds of energy resources, but the direction I think is very clear. And when we look at geothermal, we quite often have put things into into the perspective of where does the geology fit in all of this. And of course, geothermal energy, the way we know it um, and the way the public generally knows it is basically, it's very much connected with volcanic activities. And for, for, for every one of us, it's, I think it's very clear, volcanic activities happens where tectonic plates meet. Uh, and this is where in the, in the context of geothermal, the, the manifestation of this wonderful energy source is basically closest to the surface. And that's why we've seen most of the development and interest in, the, in those regions. So along the Pacific Ring of Fire, uh, but all the other tectonic uh, areas as well. This is a map that was created with data from Think Energy on our power plant here by uh, Julie Eckbert uh, from the KFZ in Potsdam. Uh, together with, with uh, other authors. And here the idea was to kind of explore power generation technologies and how they fit geographically in the geological settings. And here basically that look of where are things happening in geothermal development, where is most of the developing happening both in scale and in technology. So in here the technology gives an indication of the type of resource that is being tapped. So high temperature resources uh, for, for flash and dry steam operations, uh, and let's say lower temperature, low enthalpy resources uh, for binary. And clearly that is moving away then from this clear defined tectonic uh, uh, lines. Um, and this is kind of like how where we are today. So this is kind of like an underlying hot zones of this world, these high temperature regions and where things are. Uh, and looking at the installed capacity versus the, the opportunity. And this looks here at uh, traditional uh, conventional geothermal power generation technologies uh, here for um, like flash and, and binary based, uh, but it would not take in, in, into considerations um, a wider application of EGS or, or other uh, advanced geothermal energy systems. So, but basically this, what, what this shows here is that basically we have a huge amount of untapped geothermal potential. And that of course applies to high and, and low enthalpy resources. And if you look at where we can find geothermal power plants here, this is uh, research done by us. It's, it's basically all the geothermal power plants in the world uh, today. And they give a clear indication of, let's say the tectonic settings here along the, 
uh, the tectonic uh, line. So if you take the whole west coast of the Americas uh, going down to, to Chile, um, we see uh, the East African Rift, uh, we see the Philippines, uh, Indonesia, uh, and Japan and going up uh, into, uh, into uh, Russia. Uh, and we see some of the binary uh, uh, activities uh, in Europe, for example, in Turkey and in, uh, uh, in Central Europe. And of course, Iceland at the, at the outburst of the, of the uh, American plate and the Eurasian plate here as well. And then of course, the Azores uh, in the middle of the Atlantic. So this is basically where we have a lot of the geothermal uh, power plants as of today. And if you look at the, uh, the current installed power generation capacity in the, in, in the world, we have a total capacity of around 16,000 megawatts. And of that, we have these classic examples of the high temperature resource countries like the United States, Indonesia, the Philippines, New Zealand, uh, Mexico, Kenya, and Italy, Iceland, and Japan. I mean, these are the classic geothermal countries which we connect with volcanic activities or in, in a sense, at least with the geological settings along these tectonic plates. But we see here one outburst and this is Turkey. Uh, and I will explain a little bit uh, on that uh, later on. Here clearly a country that has uh, punched above its weight utilizing low enthalpy resources. And if you look at current installed capacity in the world today, uh, this is uh, uh, another overview here with all the countries uh, today. So we have currently 30 countries uh, producing uh, geothermal power. Actually, it's uh, 29 if you look at this. Um, but uh, the, this is the installed capacity. And we see that we have these top 10 countries here that I, that I showed earlier. And then all the other countries here, including then Latin America or Central America, uh, and then going down to these smaller countries, uh, including such as Croatia, uh, one of the newcomers, uh, um, and Taiwan, uh, but also Hungary uh, and Austria here as, as examples. But, and this is uh, something that we are currently uh, or, or continue to work on, is that with ongoing development and planned development in countries, the number of countries with geothermal power generation could reach actually the number 82. So from 30 or 29 countries today, we could reach that about 82 countries would produce geothermal power. And of course, the impact that could have on, uh, on the visibility of geothermal uh, across the world is, you know, it could be quite, quite large. Um, and if we look at the, uh, the development of geothermal here, I've been trying to kind of get a clear picture of the annual additions of power generation. And we've been only able to kind of provide this from 2006 on here uh, in this context. Uh, and we see that really different stage of development and really kind of seeing lots of development in certain days and stages, and then basically dropping off again seeing it burst up again, and so on and so forth. And this is, this is of course, something where we don't see the hockey stick growth that we see in other uh, renewable energy technologies, such as wind and solar. And of course, this is a concern for geothermal, particularly in the way of how we are uh, expanding, position ourselves, and being taken serious. And this is uh, another overview here uh, from 1958 on to show how geothermal has developed uh, by regions. And we see here really kind of how an impactful Asia and Pacific as a market has been uh, for geothermal. Uh, and we see kind of here, and we added in some, uh, some lines here for like to show an impact or a perceived impact of uh, different uh, events here. So the oil crisis in the seventies, the oil price shock in 1990, the energy crisis uh, around the financial collapse of 2003 to 2008. And of course, Ukraine, uh, which might not be having an impact that much on power generation, but I will talk about this uh, uh, later on. But it basically shows that these crises have an impact or have had an impact on geothermal, but it has been a, taken a long time to really move geothermal forward. 
So for example, the oil crisis in the 70s clearly pushed geothermal to uh, uh, on the forefront in, in several countries. And that's when we've seen a lot of development being kicked off in the United States. Uh, but as soon as the oil price falls again, we see that kind of there's a drop again in activities and investment. So this is the regional overview, um, but to put things into context with regards to uh, the technologies, uh, here an overview of the different power generation technologies. Uh, and this is, and this gives an indication of where in the world geothermal development has happened. So here, dry steam and flash, uh, conden flash condensing uh, technologies are utilizing high temperature resources that are 180 to 200 degrees Celsius. So already really high temperatures that are needed to kind of utilize this technology for power generation. And binary technology, of course, is uh, utilizing a secondary fluid uh, for uh, the, the, the turbine or for the, the power generation. Uh, and here basically utila being able to utilize temperatures that go down to 70 degrees Celsius. Uh, of course, here in this context, probably most of development has happened uh, in resources that are at least 100, 100 degrees Celsius, but basically going from 100 to 160, 100 to 80 degrees Celsius. So we see an increased utilization of lower temperature, low enthalpy resources for power generation. Uh, and this is an indication also here of where this has developed. So we see this just in particular in the last seven years, seven to eight years, that there's been a complete shift. So we see that bin binary cycle technology is by far the largest uh, uh, growth uh, for geothermal power generation. And here clearly also an indication that development in geothermal moves further and further to uh, low enthalpy resources uh, across the world, but also utilizing higher temperatures on the lower end of the spectrum. So there's a lot of happening with the technology development, with the pricing of the technology, et cetera, to the point where today from a 12% from a market share in 2015, the market share of the technology of installed uh, power generation capacity for binary cycle has increased to 25%. Uh, and here also, if you look at selected countries here, we see also that in the United States in Indonesia and Turkey, the diff there's a clear difference. Indonesia, of course, a very tectonic active uh, uh, region with volcanic activities, but also really good geothermal resource and probably the largest resources uh, in the world. Clearly here, high temperatures kind of favor technologies uh, with flash condensing turbines and dry steam. So this is of course here the, the, the largest share in power generation technology. Uh, Turkey, as I said, most of the resources are lower temperature, low enthalpy resources in the Western part of the country. Um, and here, utilizing binary technology is, is basically giving a must. Uh, in the United States, uh, of course, a lot of development has happened in the Western United States. Uh, so California, um, uh, most, of, most of the power plants here with flash condensing and dry steam uh, turbines, but we've seen an increasing development uh, further inland. So away from the tectonic areas, uh, for example, into, into the state of Nevada. And here, particularly the activities of, uh, of Ormat uh, in that context kind of really has pushed binary cycle technology in the market. And we see uh, this to continue uh, in that degree. Um, and regarding uh, technologies also, uh, the, there is an increasing move, let's say not away, but there's a shift of scaling. So while we've seen in the past, predominantly large scale development uh, for power generation, like here with a 50 megawatt flash turbine at the Thestarike geothermal power plant in Iceland, uh, a turbine here by Fuji Electric, uh, we see a move to smaller uh, units. Uh, and that can be here, for example, a, a, a flash condensing plant uh, by, by Tosh Toshiba, a geoportable flash plant, uh, in uh, Waita, Japan, that's a five megawatt plant. Uh, so quite 
a different scale of power plant. The idea here is that you, you can develop a geothermal power projects faster, uh, but also more fitting into the local environment uh, and to the, to the energy demand locally. But we also see a further drive, and this is, as I said, the, the drive to smaller scale units, tapping uh, low enthalpy resources. Here, a small 150 kilowatt uh, plant in, in Beppu in Japan uh, by Electratherm. And the, and the context here is very interesting. It is, it is essentially utilizing a low temperature resources from, from natural occurring hot springs, uh, producing power without impacting the water flow for those geothermal baths. Uh, because that is a big concern in particular in Japan is that if you were to drill for, for geothermal resources, you could essentially dry up uh, the resource for the spa industry. And of course, nobody wants that. So the idea is here to kind of go with smaller, less impactful uh, installations and utilizing uh, geothermal also for power generation, creating, base, creating green electricity uh, in addition to the hot water used for, for tourism. So that is, a, that is a very, very good example of how things are evolving also in geothermal. Uh, of course, if it will bring the scale that we want to really bring geothermal forward to the degree is that's a bit of a question. So if you look at power generation capacity, I, I, I showed earlier the uh, capacity additions uh, that, that, that we've shown. Um, and we tried to do a little bit of an estimate here uh, of where things are evolving in the next uh, seven to eight years. And we believe that, that geothermal power generation development is picking up already. Um, it will pick up further. Uh, particularly in areas where geothermal makes sense, so in, in mostly in the high temperature uh, regions, but also, um, but also in lower temperature uh, areas here, particularly in areas where there are no other uh, electricity or, or energy resources for, for power generation, uh, and also uh, where pricing uh, is favorable for, to, to actually develop geothermal. Uh, this is a conservative growth estimate. Um, we believe that with advanced geothermal technologies, uh, you know, we could see an, an expansion of the development and, 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 and a further growth. Uh, but at this point, it's very difficult to, to make assumptions. So we are giving here this, this conservative growth estimate of about 5,000 megawatts to add, which would bring us to 21,000 plus uh, megawatt uh, in 2030. And of course, this is in the greater scale of things, let's say not the incredible huge uh, push for geothermal that we probably, probably hope. But with new technologies, and new drilling technologies, maybe we, maybe we can change that. But there's a, a huge impact here. And this is that we have to think of geothermal energy beyond electricity and the impact that geothermal can have uh, for the energy transition. I think this is very, very clear. Uh, and this is actually probably the more important uh, role for geothermal going forward. And of course, this is then the impact that low enthalpy resources could provide because it could expand uh, the geothermal energy use beyond the traditional geothermal countries along the tectonic plates. And if you look at the, the, the energy demand in the European Union, as an example here, um, the final demand uh, in the 28 countries of the EU is around 14,000 terawatt hours of, uh, of energy. Uh, and of that, the heating and cooling demand is about 44%. So while our current effort on the energy transition lies primarily on electricity, uh, and transportation, one should not forget and one cannot forget the heating aspect of, uh, of, geo of, of the energy market. And this is where in particular fossil fuels play today still an incredibly important role and, uh, uh, and a very crucial role 
uh, which is also providing certain challenges in the European uh, energy market today. So in this context, we need to talk about geothermal direct use. And of course, if it needs to be like the geothermal baths and hot springs in, in Japan or elsewhere in Europe, uh, we have to understand that what can geothermal energy provide in the context of utilizing heat that we have at hand directly. And in this context, uh, several years ago, I tried to, to kind of provide, let's say an overview of the value proposition of geothermal in the context of renewable energy. And here we clearly kind of disregard any fossil fuel source basis but purely looking at the renewable energy sources that are available today and what we can, for how we use them and, and for what we can use them. And I think it is very clear here, we have certain things to think about. So the energy that we need as a population, we need cooling, we need electricity and we need heat. And underlying, we also have to figure out a way of how we can store that energy. And with renewable energy resources, we have to look at what role can these renewable energy sources in fact play? So we look at biomass. What do we do with biomass? Biomass we burn and with burn we create heat. And with the heat, we then produce electricity, heating and with absorption chillers also cooling. Solar, uh, we, we, uh, solar energy can produce uh, uh, heat in, in concentrated solar power. And it here, of course, then creates heat, which then in turn produces electricity. Uh, but it can also provide heat with heat panels, uh, et cetera. Uh, photovoltaic basically produces uh, electricity directly. Uh, wind, of course, uh, produces electricity only. Um, and then we have geothermal energy and geothermal energy is the only renewable energy source that can provide all three aspects directly. So the heat of geothermal energy can provide, uh, can generate electricity, as I indicated earlier with uh, turbine technologies. Uh, it can provide heat where we utilize the heat directly or with absorption chillers, we can actually then also create cooling. And of course, if we take this one step further, we can utilize also uh, aquifers in the, in, the, uh, in the ground for storage of heat. And of course, with geothermal, it could even be heated even further. So this is a very rough idea to, to put uh, geothermal energy in a perspective and highlighting the role that geothermal energy can play if we were to look at purely renewable energy resources. And then let's look at the challenges that we face today. Uh, we face the issue of fossil fuel based heating. And this is a, a picture that I've, I've been using a lot to highlight the fact of how important and what role geothermal can play to clean up the heating sector. Uh, whoever has been in, in Beijing in the winter, uh, you've, you've kind of smelled the coal dust in the air. Uh, same uh, experience in Poland and other Eastern European countries. Uh, so the coal dust and the impact it has on health is, is tremendous. So that's why China, for example, really kind of created a program with smoke-free cities, pushing geothermal energy as a source uh, for heating to clean up the heating sector. So this is a very important aspect is how to, to kind of move away from fossil fuels, not only for the CO2 emissions, but also by, for the emissions that we generate in general. So all kind of dust uh, and smoke that, that, you, that you can feel. And of course, this is a huge impact on the health uh, of people. And then of course, there's another aspect, and this is a very sad one, and it is about energy security. And I could have shown you now a picture of, of people uh, freezing in, in their offices in Europe with temperatures being pulled down to 19 degrees, but I think we should put this into, into relations and see what impact a war can have on a nation like Ukraine at the moment. 
So here, the impact it has on the in energy infrastructure in the country itself, and of course, then indirectly for the whole energy market uh, in Europe and beyond for that matter. So the impact of energy security is increasingly important uh, for us when we look at energy. And this is exactly what's happening in Europe. And that is changing also completely the picture for uh, geothermal energy in Europe. So when we look at uh, geothermal resources and, and what we can do, of course, I could show you now the high temperature resources uh, at a depth level of 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 meters uh, with EGS opportunities to utilize high temperatures found uh, at depth, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But that would limit geothermal to certain areas in Europe that have those resources. So if you look at Italy, for example, where of course one of the, the, the birthplace of geothermal power generation in Lauderello in Tuscany, here we have high temperatures being, being able to utilize for power, for power generation. We have Iceland, of course, uh, and, but in the rest of Europe, the temperatures are relatively low or we have to drill very, very deep. Examples here in Germany, for example, uh, where we have to drill very, very deep uh, in the south of the country to gather the temperatures that we need for, for economic power generation. Uh, we have the Alsace region and uh, the Upper Rhine uh, area uh, between uh, France and Germany here, also with higher temperatures and power generation, uh, but of course, relatively costly with regards to the depth that we need to drill to, uh, to gather this, the temperatures that we need for power generation. But Europe has geothermal resources of lower temperature and lower enthalpy resources that are providing a tremendous energy opportunity for Europe. Uh, and here the impact uh, essentially is that what can we do with these temperatures? So these temperatures uh, of anything between 30 and, and 100 degrees Celsius are potentially enough for power generation, but probably too costly compared to other uh, energy sources, but we can utilize lower temperatures directly for heating applications. So for example, in district heating uh, networks uh, that exist for industrial use, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there are a large number of opportunities of where we can utilize low temperature resources uh, of geothermal. So low enthalpy resources. And where do we utilize geothermal energy today for, for heat? So direct uh, use applications. So we use them uh, for heat pumps today, which is the largest uh, utilization of, let's say a certain temperature in the ground. Uh, and then that is followed of course, by bathing and swimming, space heating and so on. Uh, if we disregard heat pumps, uh, which are more shallow, this is the picture that, we've, that we see today with regards to uh, the utilization of geothermal energy. Bathing and swimming is still the largest utilization of geothermal, uh, followed by space heating. So here, uh, for example, district heating or heating of buildings, greenhouse heating, industrial uses, uh, heating of aquaculture, so fish farming, uh, but also drying of agricultural products and snow smelting. So here, these are basically utilizations of geothermal for direct use today. And they are providing a great opportunity and a, and a fantastic growth opportunity as well. So here, if you look at uh, the, um, the growth that we've seen in, uh, uh, in geothermal direct use here without the heat pumps, We've seen that in the growth between um, uh, 2015 and 2020, we see, sorry, this is uh, two, between 2000, sorry. The, the change between 2000 and 2020, here the, the growth that we've seen in these different categories. So bathing, swimming, and space heating, pushing ahead with the geothermal energy use. And we see that this will increase even further 
by 2030. So our estimate that we believe that from 2020 to 2030, it will grow by another 212%. And that might even just the beginning because we're seeing increased interest in the replacement of uh, fossil fuel heating applications uh, with renewable energy sources. Uh, and if you look at uh, the top geothermal countries here uh, for, the, for direct use, uh, China is by far the leader. Uh, so China is utilizing geothermal the most in, in for heat, followed by Turkey, Japan, uh, Iceland, Hungary, and then others. So clearly here there's room for growth in different countries and with everything that's going on today, we believe that this will expand dramatically going forward. So today, Asia and Europe are the, the largest regions with regards to direct use uh, utilization. Uh, as I said, here in Asia, it's mostly, if not all, China. Uh, and in Europe, as I said, it's, it's mostly Turkey and, uh, and the rest of Europe. And the rest of the countries are, are clearly behind. Uh, and of course, the heat demand uh, is different in different countries. But we see, for example, in Africa and, and other locations that uh, heating for greenhouses is, is by far also uh, something uh, that we will see in areas uh, being developed there. And that brings me to the uh, technology overview of geothermal and what are the current uh, developments in that regard. Um, and this is where we see an increasing broadening of the technologies in the utilization of geothermal energy today. So from the traditional heat pump, shallow uh, closed loop systems, uh, utilizing low temperatures in the ground of everything between seven and, and, and 15, 20 degrees, uh, to really targeting supercritical uh, deep uh, geothermal. For example, here, the, the, the Iceland deep drilling project in Iceland uh, targeting temperatures of 300 degrees Celsius and more uh, with, the, with the plan to utilize this higher energy density uh, from those higher temperatures and, and thereby increasing the energy output per well and thereby also changing the costs of uh, geothermal power generation development. And of course, there's a whole load of, of different technologies in between. Uh, we have these, uh, these deep closed loop systems where I basically drill uh, some kind of uh, closed loop system that is trying to extract uh, the temperature uh, in, in, in areas that don't have the, the hydrothermal resources. So for example, drilling into granite, but still extracting the heat. Uh, so that is being developed and, and test projects are being done. Uh, we have, of course, the traditional EGS project, engineered or enhanced geothermal systems, where you, in lack of a hydrothermal system you, or a, a, a non-producing system, you're trying with stimulation uh, and fracking, you try to create uh, artificially a reservoir. And that can be done uh, relatively open. It can be done by multi-stage factoring. Um, or here in this kind of tree uh, uh, root approach uh, uh, proposed by several other com uh, companies. Uh, and these petrothermal systems or EGS systems here, the idea is, is utilizing oil and gas technology uh, to extract uh, heat from the ground, be it by pushing down water or other, or other uh, uh, elements. There's talk about even utilizing CO2 as a carrier of heat uh, to be heated up in the ground and then being and being used to take the heat up to the surface where it's then being utilized either for heat production or then through heating up a fluid that steams for a turbine to produce electricity. Uh, and then you have these large hydrothermal uh, systems uh, that can be utilized for heat and power. Uh, and here the idea is, is that you utilize a water-based hydrothermal uh, resource uh, where you utilize the water as the carrier of the heat to the, to the surface. Uh, and with pumps, you, you drive it to the, to the surface uh, and then basically you utilize it to generate electricity. Uh, 
or you utilize it directly if the heat is not hot enough for power generation. And then you have an increasing marrying of technologies. So you have from the heat pump side of this things in geothermal, you have more and more companies going deeper uh, up to, to 1,000, 2,000 meters uh, with similar technology like we use today in the, in the closed loop ground source heat pump uh, technologies. But the idea here is to extract higher temperature and with that increase the efficiency of the heat pump on the surface and utilize less electricity. And then is this whole uh, uh, concept as well. That is what uh, my company Energy is doing. We are tapping hydrothermal resources that are hot enough to, to, to or warm enough to provide uh, energy uh, to the surface to be utilized for heating, but be using heat pumps to increase the temperatures to 90 or more degrees Celsius uh, to be then fed into the district heating systems that need the higher temperatures than the 60 or 40 degrees you might find. Uh, but utilizing these higher temperatures from hydrothermal systems provides an opportunity to utilize less electricity because otherwise we are straining more and more the electricity market by utilizing electricity directly for lower grade uh, heat pump systems like seawater heat pumps or uh, river heat pumps, et cetera, which utilizing lower temperatures and with that need more electricity uh, for heat generation. And of course, this is a strain for uh, the electricity grid and, and, the, and, the, and, and the, the electricity demand, particularly because, because, because it will be to peak demand periods when it's particularly cold. And we see what can then, uh, what, what uh, can result is, for example, in Texas last winter, uh, when you had these uh, electricity grid uh, uh, blackouts. Uh, and, and of course, the less electricity you, you use, you create more efficiently energy and heat uh, to be used on the surface. And you do that also by having to generate less electricity. And then here is a, is a very good example of how a city is approaching geothermal energy. And this is here the approach of Helsinki um, in, in, in Finland. Uh, that is, is, of course, looking at a way of how can a city extract renewable energy or utilize renewable energy for the energy systems that they have. And of course, heating here is a very crucial aspect for a very cold country. Uh, so here, the city of Helsinki is approaching the, the, the energy transition through tapping to, into geothermal with ground source heat pumps. So classic smaller scale uh, heat pumps utilizing shallow energy of seven to 10 degrees Celsius with heat pumps and electricity for heating uh, and cooling, uh, but also with a, a deeper heat exchange systems that go down to up to 2000 meters um, there's a Finnish startup uh, that has created technology to, to utilize uh, these temperatures kind of that are further down and explain then utilizing heat pumps on the surface for heat generation that are then basically fed into the district heating systems. And then uh, an ultra deep heat exchange system here set uh, developed uh, in, in Espo in, in, in close to, to Helsinki where a company drilled six to 7,000 meters into granite and is trying to extract the heat there for the heating system. And furthermore, the city is also uh, planning a heat storage uh, setup and facility utilizing salt caverns uh, in the ground to store heating heat uh, over, this, over the summer to be utilized in the winter. So here, and this is a good example also for everyone in the oil and gas sector, we see an increasing move of the traditional purely geothermal market into a geo energy market. So marrying, let's say, uh, shallow geothermal or ground source heat pumps to deeper heat exchange systems, uh, energy storage, for example, aquifer uh, storage, uh, ultra deep heat exchange and hydrothermal resources, the petrothermal resources. So I would say that we as a sector moving more and more from a geothermal purely geothermal sector to one that is increasingly becoming a geoenergy 
uh, a market uh, and sector, uh, and, and thereby providing a broader utilization of the experience, know-how, and education of uh, everyone working in the oil and gas uh, and uh, extracting uh, technologies. So that's definitely uh, what we see is happening and, and providing great opportunities going into the future. Um, and we see a lot of development, as I said, uh, we have a, a lot of geothermal development uh, happening in the context of heat demand. So here, for example, a good example is the, uh, uh, the greenhouse sector in the Netherlands, um, he, a sector that needs heat for the greenhouses. Uh, and here where a lot of greenhouse growers actually have joined forces and developed geothermal for their, their greenhouse operations because energy prices uh, became more and more expensive. And for those that have managed to successfully drill for geothermal, utilizing geothermal, they today have stable energy prices uh, instead of those that still depend on gas uh, or utilizing uh, the heat from gas fired power plants uh, for heating because the cost has been so, uh, has increased so dramatically. Uh, and of course that makes uh, cost for food production more expensive. And then with that also the, uh, the food prices for the consumer. So of course, this is a big impact that uh, that has already had. Uh, we see an increasing uh, combined uh, utilization of geothermal for heat and power generation. Good examples here are these uh, combined heat and power plants in Bavaria in Germany, uh, where the plant uh, produces electricity from the higher temperature it, uh, it generates from the, from the ground. Uh, but after the power generation, the water is still warm enough to be fed into the local district heating network. And of course, this is, this is a great opportunity also for the, the developer because it of course provides uh, a double uh, income streams. We see the utilization of, of geothermal for food dehydration. Uh, here to the left, this is uh, an example of, uh, of a, a pilot plant uh, or production in Mexico. Um, we see an increasing uh, look at how, where does geothermal fit into the green hydrogen production? Uh, so utilizing the heat, for example, et cetera. So there are all kinds of aspects here. Um, and we see, of course, as I showed this picture with China before, uh, you know, cleaning up the, the, the air. And we see increasingly geothermal development in areas that we consider not traditional geothermal countries. And of course, here, the, the Rotterdam uh, Harbor uh, looking at utilizing geothermal for heating. Uh, we see Copenhagen uh, developing geothermal. And of course, what a lot of people don't know, uh, Paris actually has probably the largest uh, geothermal heat uh, district heating. Uh, it's just in, in separate individual uh, district heating networks. So there's a lot of things happening in the direct utilization of geothermal energy today. And with that, I want to kind of briefly touch upon a little bit uh, on, on, on our company and energy. Uh, that is kind of like a good example of where we are moving in utilizing low enthalpy uh, geothermal. And the idea is how can we utilize geothermal today in the context of the energy transition or the heat transition in Europe? We've, we've started as a company building upon the uh, background of our colleagues in the oil and gas sector here with Mask Oil and Mask Drilling, um, founding a, a company that focuses on geothermal heat, so only heating, providing a business model that provides uh, an opportunity to develop geothermal heating projects without the risk for cities. And our pilot project, uh, where we got we're gonna start drilling this summer, it will be in Aarhus in Denmark, so Denmark's second largest city. And clearly Denmark is in the, in the, in the general context, maybe not really that considered that geothermal country, but we still find at about 1800 to 2000 meters, we find temperatures of up to, up to 90 degrees Celsius. So here opportunity to, to utilize those temperatures for the local district heating. And we do that by decentralizing uh, 
uh, energy production or heat production by creating and drilling locally within cities uh, in different locations, uh, generating heat locally to feed it into the local network. So in this case, from, from a scale, it's up to about 110 megawatt of thermal uh, total uh, with about 17 wells to be drilled within the proximity of the city. Uh, so clearly a change of what we see in the geothermal world today by moving geothermal away from centralized large scale development for power generation in remote areas or uh, to areas where we, use, where we generate energy close to where the demand is. So here in this case, cities and integrating thereby geothermal facilities uh, into the cities, providing green heat and replacing fossil uh, based uh, heating uh, as of today. So in the case of O's this is mostly biomass uh, and producing uh, energy. And of course the context of uh, Developing geothermal in cities provides a whole different, uh, different uh, quality. So you need to drill with close to, to the population. And of course, this is a challenge. There is uh, there's noise from drilling. There might be some emissions. Uh, this is a nuance also with regards to the construction and the, and the equipment you need to have on site, et cetera, et cetera. So of course, for people, it's a, it's, it's a challenge to, uh, uh, to accept or to work on the acceptance of geothermal development in cities. But given the current market, the price development, et cetera, et cetera we see that a lot of uh, cities uh, and individuals and, and households understand the value geothermal can bring and accept that there might be some uh, disturbance of their daily lives for a certain period of time if you can long-term trust on a local energy source and stable prices. So that is something that kind of really changes also uh, geothermal. And of course, in the public perception, uh, drilling geothermal uh, in cities is of course an eyesore for many to seeing a, a, a large scale drilling rig within the city, but it's also an opportunity to bring geothermal closer to the people and educate people about the opportunities that geothermal provides. So it is a, it is a bit of a blessing and a challenge, but we need to bring geothermal to the people because we need, and that, that's the advantage of geothermal. It is a resource that is local and we need to generate it where it's needed. And our idea is to, to then uh, with these, these, uh, with these uh, local uh, drillings to integrate then the uh, heating plants within the city so that they are not uh, appearing as industrial or too industrial to not fit into the urban settings. So that is changing completely how you implement geothermal into urban areas. And as part of the presentation, I was asked to kind of look into the repurposing of oil and gas wells. Um, and this has been, of course, a topic that has been discussed a lot in the geothermal world and the opportunities it provides, but there are also a large number of challenges. And the question, and then this is what I've indicated earlier, is the question is, where are those oil wells? How economically can you utilize them? And how do you, and where do you produce the energy that you extract from the ground? A lot of these oil wells are, are, are based uh, in remote areas. So you have to figure out a way of how to generate uh, energy and in what form. If it's heat, it's very difficult to transport heat. So you would need big pipelines, et cetera. And that can be quite costly. Uh, with electricity, okay, it might be less costly, but it's still costly to, to put uh, uh, in, uh, transmission infrastructure. So there's, there are a lot of aspects that are, that are important when you look at repurposing oil and gas wells, but we are seeing a continued increased uh, interest, uh, but also development. And with that, I want to kind of touch upon a little bit on a study that my colleagues at Kangia did uh, of uh, here looking at 
all the oil and gas wells that have been drilled in the province of Alberta. And they provided a dashboard looking into kind of how can we utilize or what of those wells can we utilize. So they looked at these 60, so they looked at these 600,000 wells and estimated that about 60,000 wells have a potential for geothermal production. So power generation here, uh, only about 500 wells. And of course that depends on the temperature that you find. Uh, industrial heat, uh, but also, but, but more so the direct, uh, direct heat here with about 53,000 wells that can be utilized for that. And of course, that's then the challenge with regards to where are those wells? Are they close to, to, uh, to municipalities, uh, to, to uh, settlements, uh, to people that could utilize the heat? Or can you provide some uh, production, for example, greenhouses at these areas? These are all kinds of things to think about with regards to the feasibility of utilizing those gas wells. And like I said, the, the dashboard here is, is, is a great, great example of kind of looking into this. And we understand that there is a lot of development and, uh, and research being done in the United States and Texas, for example, uh, but also in other countries in the UK, um, also in the context of offshore geothermal. So utilizing uh, existing offshore, offshore wells um, or abandoned wells, uh, et cetera. So there's a lot of, a lot of uh, development and exploration happening. But I think that the most crucial aspect will be uh, how do you, where do you do it and how do you utilize the energy to be used by someone? Of course, the commercial, how commercial it becomes and how economic it becomes to develop those, those wells for energy production will be a, a big issue going forward. And as I said, there's a lot of development um, and that is also, I think, a very interesting aspect. And this is the utilization of uh, hot water generated with oil uh, production. So here by uh, PowerX Resources, a Canadian company in Colombia, uh, here utilizing the hot water produced with, with oil production to utilize then uh, for, for power generation that can be then used uh, locally and then maybe replace diesel power generation. Uh, and that is an interesting aspect here. And this is a small 150 kilowatt uh, unit, but nevertheless, it shows an opportunity of how you can utilize hot water produced by, uh, by oil production. There's a similar example in, in Canada where an abandoned gas field uh, is, is being, being refurbished uh, for, for geothermal production. Uh, here, this is close to settlements and there is a power line. So there's a possibility to to transfer the power somewhere else. Uh, there's another Canadian project that uh, utilizes, going to utilize geothermal and using gas to, ex to expand the heat uh, of fluids uh, being found, and thereby combining gas with geothermal. So there's a lot happening in this context. Uh, there are also projects uh, in, the, um, in the US, uh, also funded by the Department of Energy here, a good example is the, a pilot plant by Transitional Energy in Nevada uh, and utilizing existing wells for, for geothermal energy production. And of course, you see here the remoteness. And it's always the question, basically, how can you make this economically by, by a byproduct here from an existing well? So that is becoming an interesting aspect of how can this be done? And the business model to utilize uh, those wells will be uh, the, the main challenge, but also be cre creating a fantastic business opportunity if someone manages to, to, to fix that. Uh, and with that, uh, I, I want to stop here. Uh, I assume that um, there are a lot of questions that you might have. There are quite a few topics I might not have covered. Uh, so I'm willing to kind of engage with you on any questions that you might have, uh, but maybe leave with you with a nice geothermal project picture here before uh, giving over to Gabriel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alexander. That was a very insightful presentation. And you're absolutely right. We had a pretty dynamic chat box with a lot of questions. Before we delve into those, there is a poll that's being launched right now, just trying to understand our audience. And in the meantime, wanted to ask you if 
it would be okay with you to share this um, slide back with the participants and the recording? Yes. Absolutely, that's great news. So that's what we will do uh, after the event. We're gonna follow up and share it. So we're getting our answers in. And the question was, are you directly involved with geothermal projects? And the idea behind this is just try to understand what is the, the attendance of, uh, of our participants today. So if we end the poll and share the results, what you're seeing is that 48% of the audience is directly involved with geothermal projects. 14% is a no, and there's 38% that's a no, but they would like to. So um, I think this as being one of the first talks that we're doing and trying to push for this effort, hopefully we'll get that number to rise. Uh, if you're okay with it, I am gonna go to the questions. There's been quite a bit, and I'll start off with the first question. And that comes from, uh, I apologize in advance if I don't pronounce the names correctly, from Malika. And it says, just a second, because there's been a bunch here. Okay, actually, the first one here I see is from Rajnesh and says, please share the parameters like temperature, pressure, steam flow rates of the 150 kilowatt Beppu project in Japan. Also a little bit on the economics of geothermal plants like drilling costs, plant cost, transmission. And that's, that's a lot of questions in one, but hopefully you can, you can comment that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, so let me, let me uh, expand a little bit here the discussion on, on the economics. So the challenge, of course, is, is always the levelized cost of energy production uh, and, and generation. So, so for us, how to make uh, geothermal competitive is, is, a, is, a, is a big question. So the question has always been, how can we compare with other technologies to be taken serious? And one of the, the key aspects that has been raised again and again is about kind of what are the general costs for geothermal? And this is, of course, the challenge is it's not so easy to answer because it depends of where you are in the world, how expensive the drilling rig is, how expensive are the crews to drill, uh, how expensive it is to ship the technology, and essentially also, and I mean you all understand, the difference of five hundred or thousand meters, a thousand meters to drill, uh, you know, is is a huge difference with regards to the capital expenditure for a project to start off. But of course, and this is something that, that you have to talk about in the economics of geothermal, is you have potentially a project that produces energy for 30 plus years. So yes, the, the capital expenditure to start with is quite high and so on uh, is, is, is quite an issue. So, and with that setting the tone for the question with regards to, to BAPU, 150 kilowatt unit. Of course, here, the question really is, is kind of, is there an existing well? Or did you have to drill the well? Uh, do you have uh, the water on the surface and utilize that, uh, et cetera? So this, of course, depends all quite a bit of how you, how you explore this. Uh, I, I'm not able to provide details on this BAPU plant uh, uh, as an example, but I know that and there are uh, several papers out there uh, on this um, on this technology. So I strongly recommend that you utilize uh, the existing uh, paper databases that you can access. Uh, and I here recommend the, the database of the International Geothermal Association, for example, a very useful uh, database uh, for some of the World Geothermal Congress papers uh, that provide some of those details uh, for these plants, such as flow rates, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, the, uh, there's another platform, the Geothermal Library by, the, uh, by Geothermal Rising in the United States that also has a ton of papers uh, available. Uh, a lot of them also talking about the economics. Uh, so with that, uh, maybe putting things into, into context with regards to the economics of plants. So the challenge, as I said, of course, is the, is the, the how do you define the cost? Um, depending on where you are, the cost of a, of a plant can be that up to 60% uh, or up to 40% of, uh, of a geothermal project can be the cost for the drilling. Uh, so it is a, a large chunk that you have to come up with before you actually know that you have a resource that is economic to be utilized. 
Uh, that is, of course, a risk element that is that is quite quite challenging. Um, but the drilling cost is still one of the largest aspects, and I think still the largest hurdle, because as soon as you've proven the resource to get the financing, then for the actual power plant, so the turbine, uh, the e equipment, etc., is then relatively easy in comparison. Uh, and then the turbine itself, and, and this, this the whole structure is around sixty percent of the of the of the project cost. Um, so that's uh, that's roughly uh, the element. Uh, and with regards to transmission, I mean, if you are ten kilometers away from from the grid, or if you're fifty or sixty kilometers away from the grid, of course, it has a huge impact on the economics of a project. Uh, and a good example is, uh, for example, if you take uh, the uh, the project of Cerro Pabellon in Chile, uh, high up in the Andes in the mountains uh, of Chile, uh, with a transmission line of about 60 kilometers. Uh, it is a huge costly expense to kind of transfer that electricity through uh, a transmission network. But of course, the further you're able to expand the project and utilize the same transmission line, the more economic it becomes. So with that, I'll leave that to that question, but that's unfortunately as far as I can go. Thank you very much. I think you've actually answered uh, three or four out of the questions in the chat box with that answer, so appreciate it. Um, there is another one from Daniel Merino that says, reflecting on the delay in the chart with capacity additions versus time, it was one of the slides that you showed and the events, you know, the oil crisis, Ukraine, etc. I wanted to know if in Alex's opinion and data, the time to put the capacity in place is improving or we will still see seven to 10 years from kickoff to first what? Um, I think I have to kind of like refer to a, a lot of the discussions that, that are being 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 done in, in the in, in Europe and in the United States. Uh, and I think a lot of the red tape with regards to development and why it takes such a long time is the permitting process and the time it takes to, to secure funding. Uh, so that's, that's been one of the big hurdles for Geothoma and why it has taken so long, or why it normally takes so long to develop these projects. As soon as companies have been able to drill, the de actually development time is actually relatively short. We've seen this in, uh, in, in Kenya and, and elsewhere. If you've drilled, and you have the steam output there to build a plant in a year, a year and a half is easy to do. It really, the time it takes to from permitting, etc. So what I see today, so in the context of, of power generation, it really depends on the country and how, is, how it is being set up. But we see that if there's a political will to change that, uh, then countries have been able to expand and, and, and do things relatively quickly. And there are good examples in the current crisis at the moment is in order to secure energy, a lot of the red tape has been removed. For example, with liquid, liquefied uh, natural gas uh, platforms, et cetera. So with that basically at, at, at a time that has taken normally is five to seven years has been shut down to less than a year. And I think similar things need to be done in geothermal. And there is political will to do that in specific countries. And we see this in particular for heating in Europe today. So things are speeding up. Uh, we also see different business models coming in that also make it easier to invest and get these projects off the ground. Uh, and I guess that is part also of our business model is by bundling projects uh, in these portfolios and thereby speeding up and industrializing the way we take geothermal forward. And that, of course, is also a, a way to kind of speed up development. Thank you. So where there is will, there will be action. Um, that's that's good to know. And I think a lot of the participants that are in this call, you know, with the engagement, whether you are in the geothermal world or not, you're in the oil and gas. Um, correct me if I'm wrong here, Alex, but I think it's important to, to kind of have the drive on an individual basis in whatever projects you are involved in and how can this be done better? I think one of the discussions we had was to actually talk a little more about, you know, legislation, what are the challenges? How can we push forward uh, the challenges that are fixable in a sense, in a more easy way, rather than the challenge, you know, if, okay, we're drilling in super hot rock, we're using 20 drill bits in one project, how do we do that better? So there's a lot to think of here. 
Um, and, and to add to that, Rajnesh, it kind of ties into your explanation of you know using the oil and gas projects, but he, he asks a certain segment of it that says, what should be done if water flow rates from those wells are not sufficient in the range of two to 3,000 barrels per day? So what should be minimum flow rates that can be considered for further feasibility analysis? Uh, I would lie if I would kind of throw you some numbers with, because I don't know. But what I can say is that uh, is of course one of the main challenges for geothermal is, is that we are, or our industry has a different business model than oil and gas. We are per se dealing not with a commodity business model. So we're not dealing with getting oil out of the ground and selling it at a high price for a limited amount of time. Uh, so with a relatively quick payback. I mean, okay, of course you have larger oil projects that, that are uh, more expensive to, 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 uh, to, to, to be developed, but essentially you, you gather more revenue out of, uh, out of wells than you would do from geothermal in the speed. And you, but geothermal in a sense is utilizing energy for a long time. And if, it, if it's done with a, with, a, with a living reservoir, you do this at no fuel cost. So you generate an energy and, and returns and, and revenue on a long-term basis, but at lower rates than the oil and gas sector. But the long-term cash flow that you can create from geothermal makes it actually relatively attractive for several investors uh, and players. But it is a different model with regards to oil and gas because it's not a commodity business. It is basically utilizing steam or hot water, but with utility returns. So long-term lower, lower prices uh, returns and how much flow rates you need for the energy that you that you can gather is of course is an excellent, uh, excellent exercise that you need to do as part of each individual well to explore what, what you can do and if it makes sense or not. Thank you for that. Uh, I wanted to ask you if you're okay to continue with a couple more questions. I know that the time is getting close. Would you be sure. able to help? Perfect. Sure. So we do have a question from Adrian that says, what has held back geothermal growth between 2020 and 2022 when geothermal has had more publicity ever during this period? Is the economics very local centered? Um, here again, I refer to the, to the answer of earlier about the long time it takes to develop geothermal projects. Um, and I think what happened in 2020 20 and, and, and to last year, uh, COVID clearly threw off the supply chain. So a lot of the projects that were about or were about to finish uh, construction had struggled uh, to get the necessary equipment and people on site to finish the construction. So that's why projects in Kenya and in Indonesia actually were delayed uh, and uh, only came then online, let's say late 2022 or will come online this year. Uh, so that's why with all the, all the time that I showed, is really the impact certain events have, they are, they are to be seen in the context of having long-term or, or more long-term uh, impact. So we don't, we can't uh, act as, uh, as quickly. So it's a time sensitive uh, matter. And then the complexities were quite a lot in, the, in that two year period. Which, which I think ties a little bit also to what Marcus was saying in a sense, it says, why are the estimates of growth in geothermal heat usage for greenhouse applications so conservative? But that's Where a very good, that's a very good point. Heating. That's a very yeah. good point and observation, but, uh, but of course the scale of space heating uh, in that context uh, is, is, is tremendous and how much actually we as a, as a, as a as a population or, or world will move to greenhouse operations is something that I can't, uh, I can't estimate. Uh, and it will be definitely interesting to see. And, uh, and, and if, if Marcus could share, if he has some idea about, let's say the, the current heat demand for the, for the greenhouse sector, uh, we would definitely like to, to revisit this and explore how we can, how we can recalculate uh, this for the, for the estimates. 
And we've been working together a little bit with, with uh, greenhouse uh, groups in, uh, in the Netherlands to, to understand uh, these estimates. Uh, but in the overall scale and the heat demand of populations for house heating, that's still going to be much, much larger share than greenhouses will be, at least for the, for the time being. So that's why I probably would stand with the estimates as it stands today. And that brings me to, to another question. So if, if some of the attendees in here have some more direct questions they can you know, direct to you, would it be okay to just get a hold of you through LinkedIn or that's all good? Yep. So I'm sure, okay, perfect. There, there, is, there is an interesting question here on the Arvus project that says, do you receive local subsidies and is there a, a NIMBY resistance when drilling in IMBY? Um, so um, essentially, uh, the business model that we are doing uh, as part of energy is that we are developing general projects without any subsidies. So we're, 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 financing, this, we're financing this ourselves and we're developing this uh, and are not dependent on local subsidies. If there happen to be local subsidies, it would impact the price that the customer will get. Uh, the not in my backyard uh, resistance um, we are starting the process of stakeholder engagement, uh, and, and so far it's, it's quite positive. Uh, but of course you need to deal with, uh, with, with people that, that whose life you impact with the activities for, for a period of time. So you need to make the effort of explaining what you're doing. You need, you need to take uh, concerns seriously, uh, but also highlight the positives that Geothermal provides and these projects provide. Uh, and in that sense, we are quite confident that we, 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 we have the local support, uh, the local municipalities or the city and, uh, and stakeholders are very, very positive on the project. Uh, so uh, it is about keeping people informed uh, and engaged. This is why stakeholder engagement is so crucial for any geothermal project, particularly if you take it more and more closer to the local population. Absolutely. I think I've heard that comment from some of colleagues back in the United States where they were emphasizing the importance of a very clear communication with the local community on what's going on, how is that going to impact them, but also what are the, you know, the big advantages of such projects. I think that helps a lot, you know, the transparency. Um, a little bit more of a technical question coming in from Ivan says, any, any thoughts on using CO2 as geothermal energy carrier? An electricity generation as an electricity generation medium any known active projects or projects under development um, i know that this has been a topic for quite some years uh, to utilize co2 as a, as a heat carrier uh, unfortunately i don't know where things are standing with regards to that so i can't i can't answer that but it's of course an interesting aspect because it, it would be a way of uh, of, for example, in these closed loop systems or EGS systems that are, don't have a hydrothermal resource, uh, it's definitely quite interesting. And how this can be done is a question, but, but of course, CO2 has also been looked into geothermal settings as a, uh, in the carbonization. Uh, so for example, with the CarbFix project here in Iceland. So, but how this, where this stands technical with regards to heat uh, extraction, I don't know. I think I see here there were a couple of responses on green fire energy and say geosystems that are utilizing CO2 turbines. So I think the audience can just access those. Yeah. Um, like I said, I mean, they all have, I mean, some of them are more secretive about what they're doing than others. Uh, but, I, but I believe that green fire and others have shared some, some really good papers on that, uh, on the various conference uh, databases of uh, geothermal rising and the IGA. Uh, so check check those out uh, to kind of learn more um, because the, the websites of these companies are currently not providing, let's say, that level of depth, unfortunately. Understood. Yeah, the links are up here in the chat box. Uh, there's a question coming in from Marco that says, any thoughts on using geothermal energy for regeneration heat in amine-based carbon capture projects? Sorry, could you repeat? So any thoughts on using geothermal energy for regeneration heat in a mine-based carbon capture project. I think I read that correctly. Yeah, not quite sure I understand completely, but uh, to, to, to split this. So the mine projects uh, that, that he probably refers to uh, are basically the, 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 the idea of utilizing old coal mines for, for extracting the heat there or utilizing those as a heat storage. Uh, 
Uh, and of course, this is an aspect that could be quite interesting, extracting heat basically as that as it exists below the surface in these old mines. So a lot of these mines, for example, in, in the coal mines, for example, in the UK or uh, in, in Germany had like 30, 40 degrees below the surface. And the question is, how can you extract that heat that is that you can find at that levels? And here are several uh, technological advances or, or pilot projects that are trying to figure out how you can extract that energy by either pumping down water, let it heat and then extract or using this as a heat storage or the winter, et cetera, there are all kinds of things. Okay, got it. I hope we, we, we managed to answer that. If not, I'm sure they'll get a hold of you. Um, still have a couple of more. One that comes from Satation says, what is the expected lifetime of the energy wells um, before a thermal breakthrough occurs? Uh, I mean, of course, you're, you're drilling wells that you expect to, to run at least for 30, 40 years or even longer. Um, you might have to refurbish some wells or, or, or re-drill wells. Uh, but in general, you always drill these wells and hope that, that or you plan them to be around for a long time. Uh, like I said, it de really depends on where you drill, how the, how the, uh, how the resource is and, and, and how, how much uh, salinity is in the, uh, in the fluids, et cetera, et cetera. So all of that depends a little bit, of course. Uh, but overall, you plan for 20, 30 years plus. I mean, that's, that's, that's a given. Understood. Uh, we have some regards here from our friends from Croatia that are currently drilling a deep geothermal well at 4,500 meters. We'll cross our fingers. Good luck. <laughs> good luck with that. Uh, there's another question that says, how good is the industry at dynamic modeling of heat flow and predicting the performance of the resource over time? Any idea what percentages of plants underperform or overperform versus expectations? Wow, um, very, very good question. Um, I have to pass. I don't know exactly kind of with regards to modeling software, how this is. I mean, we have, I have, of course, some, some friends in the industry that work with fantastic 3D modelings. Uh, one of them is a fantastic and, and long-term supporter of uh, I think Geology Sequent, you know, on the reservoir modeling, for example, how much they do heat modeling, I don't know. Uh, but of course you have several uh, companies and, and, and activities. And I think modeling, heat resource development over years is something that will become very important, particularly if we expand the geothermal utilization in low temperature resources, where let's say five to 10 degree change make a huge difference compared to let's say higher temperature resources of 180, 200 degrees and more. So for, of course that, that, that will make this modeling even more important. Understood. Thank you. Uh, I, I have a question that just popped up in my head and just wondering what is your opinion on it? You know, earlier you talked about the oil and gas industry per se, some of the projects. I mean, I'm sure a lot of the people, the entities have been involved in projects where, you know, they see wells at 130 degrees C producing water and the question is, can we make that happen? But what is your opinion? Do you think that there is enough discourse, enough communication um, between, let's say, the oil and gas community with the geothermal community? Do you think that enough efforts are being put in that from both sides? Do you think we can do better? I'm mean, just wondering what is your perspective on it? I mean, there, there are so many things. I mean, part of my passion for geothermal has translated in me trying to support the industry in, in a sense of how we present ourselves, how we promote ourselves, how we engage, how we, how we sell things. And I think it is very important that we, that we present geothermal as an opportunity uh, and engaging industry, researchers, technologies, uh, and not understand ourselves in silos. So this is the oil and gas industry, this is geothermal, this is something else. That working together will become so important. And I see this now with my colleagues at Energy uh, that have this oil and gas background and for them to how they it took them, it took time uh, to, to see them having evolved from their, from the pure oil and gas background towards geothermal together with geothermal experts and, and, and marrying these, 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 this know-how and this experience is an interesting uh, experience. And I think it's, it's quite crucial. And the same applies to, let's say, the less geoscience-based kind of know-how of the oil and gas sector. 
know, be it lobbying, be it marketing, uh, the way we present uh, ourselves, the way we we spend money on marketing, etc. All of these aspects are as crucial. And I think this is where we need this holistic view of us as an industry. So far in geothermal, we've been looking at, ge at geothermal very much as a geoscience problem only. And we've only talked about risks, challenges, and, uh, and yeah, and of course we have these opportunities. No, we need to put the, the opportunities and what geothermal can offer first in front, first and center, and then say, of course there are challenges, but we can overcome them with this and this and this and this. And we are making efforts as part of industry to do that. And part of that is collaboration with people across the board. And this is where, where I think, and that's what I tried to draw up earlier as part of the presentation as well, is that seeing the ground source heat pump industry and this technology of, of the district heating systems, the heat pumps, which is of course a surface issue, uh, the pumps, the ESPs, uh, the, the turbine technology, all these things which, and the, and the aquifer storage, it becomes more and more one industry that in a, in a summary will create a comp comprehensive value proposition for a geothermal, I believe, and for geoenergy as such, because, geo because aquifers are not energy production per se, but they could provide a, an, an incredibly value-based uh, uh, opportunity to utilize geoscience uh, and know-how. Thank you, thank you for that. I think uh, you know collaboration is, is is key, and I can speak from some of the personal experience speaking to professionals in the industry. There's been a lot of curriculum changes in some of the colleges that run you know petroleum engineering disciplines. A lot of uh, classes that have been added in terms of you know heat heat transfer classes that are highly focused uh, classes that focus on, on like you said geoenergy i think there are some efforts that are being made and one of the things that you know it's there's no really such a thing as an oil engineer or a gas engineer i would say you can specialize in it but the skills that are being that are being you know harnessed are really applicable and, and as such, we should be working a lot more together. I think it really resonates very strongly with us, what you just said. And hopefully this effort will start initiating even more events that are already are in place with other sections of SP and beyond. So hopefully we'll do a lot more than that. I think we're getting here to a close, Alex. I, uh, I would like to thank you for your time uh, and devotion to this. We've received great feedback in the chat box what we will do is, um, if you're kind enough to send us the slide back, we will send that and the recording for our participants. Yeah, no, that please, please, please do so. And uh, I mean, what I would like to emphasize a little bit as well is that we, so if you haven't signed up to our newsletter at Think Energy, please, please do so. There's a big sign up button at the at the on the menu. Uh, you can support us as well of sharing our our news pieces on on, on LinkedIn, uh, etc. And uh, uh, we're also expanding our research activities, uh, uh, and part of that, of course, I presented today. Um, so there's a lot of work that has gone into this. So if it's if it's of use, we're quite quite uh, glad. Um, uh, but we're trying to kind of also be a more broader, uh, let's say, platform for geothermal and the the energy transition uh, with geothermal energy. So so utilize the website. Uh, engage uh, and uh, and discuss. Uh, can we also have a LinkedIn group? So just kind of make sure to to engage and share and uh, and also news and, and and we of course all appreciate the the broader promotion of geothermal and what it has to offer. Absolutely, I'm sure that everybody's going to go on LinkedIn. Think Geo Energy. Look it up. Um, I'd like to apologize to those that didn't get some of their questions answered. Some of them got really, really into technical details and equations, and I thought maybe that could be something to directly maybe ask Alex when the time comes. We're already over the time. I'd like to thank you once again, Alex. Thanks to all the attendees, and uh, we will be we will be back with newer things to come soon yeah, in Geotherm. Thank you so much thank for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Alexander. Terrific stuff. Oh, glad to hear. Thank you. Bye bye.
Thank you. Bye. Uh, Gabby. 